Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 8, starting with verse 8 down through chapter 3 and verse 7. As we look into a somewhat controversial topic, although it's becoming less controversial as time goes on, but not so with the Word of God, as that does not change. But reading 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting with verse 8. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in sub submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall in th into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let us pray. Lord, we once again uh, take a few moments to open up your holy word. And we ask, Lord, that you may teach us the things that you desire for us to learn here. May the Holy Spirit do his work in our hearts. Help me, Lord, that I may speak clearly, that I may not stumble in my speech, Give me clarity of mind that I may be able to speak clearly that your people may be able to learn. This is indeed the voice of God, your holy word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But over the past several decades, there has been growing controversy over the issue of women in the ministry. Now, this, of course, is not a new topic. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, the Quakers, who had a, were very instrumental in founding the state of Pennsylvania, permitted women to speak in their assemblies, and this was in the 18th century. Uh, John Wesley later picked up on that. He first condemned it uh, as being out of order, but later in life he uh, ordained two women, I don't believe to be pastors, but to be able to speak. So you see that, that, that uh, things, even back then, were, were changing. The concept exploded in the 20th century with the advent of the uh, Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement. Uh, before my time, and I'm sure most of you here, uh, there was a lady by the name of Catherine Coleman. You may remember her from uh, maybe the early 70s or in the 60s. I'm not sure when she passed away, but she was a very famous uh, Pentecostal woman preacher. And prior to her, there was another woman who was primarily in the 20s and 30s by the name of Amy Semple McPherson. Uh, these were p two pioneer women in media when it came to uh, religion. Uh, and this then has led to an explosion of women in the ministry. Now, this also has followed a, a pattern among mainline denominations. As they become more and more apostate, there's less... Uh, Ad, uh, adversity, I guess you'd say, toward the idea of women ministers. And 
I guess it was about 25, 30 years ago, there was about 15% of women pastors in the mainline denominations, whereas today it's around 32%, and it's growing. Now, in the Southern Baptist Convention, a, a, a denomination which officially forbids uh, women from being ordained and preaching uh, from the pulpit as pastors, uh, there was a recently a controversy within that church centering around Rick Warren, uh, the megachurch pastor. He's the author of the famous book, The a Purpose Driven Church, a Purpose Driven Life, and so on. Uh, he had, as a Southern Baptist, as he was retiring, ordained two women as pastors in his church. And one of them was part of a pastoral team who, along with her husband, was to take over the church once he officially retired. Uh, so though this denomination officially opposed the ordaining of women, and still does officially, uh, rather than disciplining Rick Warren uh, because of his m massive influence, his mega church, and many churches, and much money coming in, I would imagine, to the denomination, instead of disciplining him, removing him from the church, you know, or from the convention, they appointed a committee to study the definition of pastor. You know, denomination that has been in existence well over 150 years or so, I guess now, uh, and that needs to go back and study what a pastor is. You know, so you see how this controversy is, is bubbling. But the real question, as it always is, is what does the Bible say? You know, we don't want to be making our decisions on feelings, on the current uh, temperature of the culture, but on what do the scriptures say? Now, as we get into this, of course, we're not saying that women are not capable of many things that men are, uh, they're, or they don't have the same worth as men, obviously. But we're looking at the, the biblical role of women in the church and family. And so that takes us then to the context of the passage we're looking at in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, we didn't read the first section of that, but it deals primarily with prayer where it says, the verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So we have Timothy being instructed by the Apostle Paul on how to be a pastor and to lead his congregation into a life of holiness. And this includes, obviously, the importance of prayer. Supplications, that is, whenever we come to God on behalf of others, Prayers, that's of all forms of prayers, but uh, the idea of the word there is special prayer, where you go to a special place to pray, such as in your, your prayer closet. Uh, intercessions, interceding on behalf of others, uh, giving of thanks, and uh, praise for answers. All of this, and for, this is to be done for all men. So, uh, Paul is teaching Timothy, we need to, to em you need to emphasize this in your church, because we want a holy church. And then verse 8, we have men in particular are to, be, are to pray. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So he moves on to general prayer to, for the men. Now wh why would he focus on the men here? Well, of course you know that, that in, in those days especially, the men would be out trying to earn a living, trying to do the best they can to bring in, sometimes just enough to eat. You know, they'd work all day and just, just have enough to eat. So they were constantly on the move. And I think Paul is emphasizing here, you don't have to pray within the church or the prayer closet. Pray everywhere. So as you are, are uh, going through the rat race, trying to take care of your family and meet the needs of your family, be praying on your drive to work. You know, or if you had a horse back in those days, well, you're riding a horse. So that's uh, the circuit riding preachers would always be praying and studying on their horses. They went from one place to another. But to be constantly in the state of prayer, that is to encourage holiness, to foster holiness in the church. And that is to support, to promote an attitude of prayer. So that's, he focused on the men. And in verse 9, he moves over to the women. How then are the, the women to be instructed in holiness. Uh, so he focuses upon them. And sad to say, since the rise of feminism, and even in a church, this passage has become unnecessarily controversial. Now that if you bring up anything like this, 
you know, you need to be prepared for opposition. You need to be prepared, perhaps, on the internet to be banned. You know, who knows what? You know, it's just that it's it's become so controversial. And I've I've been been preaching in different places in the course of forty years, and very seldom have I ever had a real negative response to my sermon. Most of the time, even if it was a bad sermon, the people would shake my hand and say, "Thank you, pastor. Thank you, pastor." But one time I, I preached on Jezebel, and I, I made mention of something about, about women. And, and uh, it wasn't personal or anything like that, but that was the time I got the phone call and was excoriated over the phone anonymously by a female parishioner. You know, so it, these are difficult things. Now, unnecessarily difficult because the church has allowed the world to infiltrate within so these things in the world are controversial. They should not be in the church because it's in the Word of God. But let's take a look. How then is the woman then to pursue holiness, at least in this manner? So Timothy is to teach the women this. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now I've been in, in churches before which uh, really get into this, but, but uh, there is... We should tread carefully in this because you cannot take a, 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 a text like this and then develop uh, rules and regulations. You know, what, what is modest apparel? Well, modest apparel to me is a certain length of skirt, is a certain style of clothing, you know, which is what, what I basically in my early Christian years was taught, you know, that uh, there are certain things that, that women are to wear or not to wear, and we, are, we can then have real cut and dried rules on this modest apparel. Well, what does it mean? Well, literally it means orderly or virtuous or decent. Uh, this is not emphasizing particular style. Or giving instructions as to, to definite things, but it is uh, giving us a, an overall picture of how a, a woman is to dress. Cultures and customs vary, you know, especially you go very far north to, to the rainforest, to the desert. Customs and, and, and apparels differ, so, so we need to always keep that in mind. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was in a church at one point where they, they, they made very, very strong rules concerning women's clothing. And someone in my family, I won't go into details on this, but was, uh, got, got herself into trouble because during a snowstorm she was wearing a snowmobile suit. And the pastor of the church saw her walking down in a snowstorm with a snowmobile suit on, and because it wasn't a dress, uh, approached another member of my family, and uh, there was some discussion over that because this person wasn't keeping his children in line. You know, so this is not what we're talking about whatsoever. You know, it's, it's not setting rule of, of certain rules you know, that, that are, are cut and dried. But rather it is, ladies, what is your attitude whenever you're dressing? How do you wish to present yourself to the world? Is it to flaunt your better attributes and gain the attention of lustful gazes. That's what it's talking about. You know that. As, as, a, as a woman, you would know that, that you're dressing in a certain way which to get the attention of ungodly men. That's not modest apparel. So you should know that as a believer. Uh, that is sin. You know in your heart when you cross that line, and others do as well, and care should be taken to avoid it. It's not a sin to look nice. But it is a sin to draw attention in a sexual and worldly way in the world. That's what that's talking about. That is to dress modestly, orderly, and in a Christian fashion, with propriety and moderation. Not focusing on outward extravagance, but on godliness. Because it says here, not with braided hair, or rather braided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly clothing. We not, our, uh, women are not, not to overdo certain things. You, and you know when, it, when you're doing it. And so you need to, to use caution. And I'm, by the way, I don't have anybody in mind here, you know, that, that I'm preaching at ladies. So just to, just to let you know. Uh, so that um, being the case, that's part of the pursuit of holiness. I look over to 1 Peter chapter 3, if you would. For, Peter ca covers basically the same thing. The first uh, six verses. First Peter chapter three, verse one. Wives, likewise, be 
submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, and so on. So, we have here, and what is being taught is that there is a noticeable distinction between the dress and attitude of worldly women and those who belong to Christ. Both Paul and Peter bring out the idea of feminine modesty as essential in the Christian faith as far as women pursuing holiness. And the importance being placed on pursuing a gentle, quiet, and submissive spirit. This is the focus of our message this evening. Men and women are equally the children of God and beneficiaries of the grace of God. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. But the scriptures also recognize that there is a difference between the genders. Here we go. Now we get into more controversy. And their purpose within God's created order are not the same. So we're, we're going to have limited time, and, and I don't want to be sending, getting, going off into a series of this. And being a Sunday night, and I don't preach every Sunday night, we won't be doing that. But I want to try to cover this as best we can to give you the, a proper idea as to the pulpit. But that, that, lays, that lays a foundation for us. But if you would, go back to our text in uh, 1 Timothy, uh, chapter 2. So we have here the place of women within the church. First of all, take a look at our, our verse, uh, first verse uh, uh, 11. We looked at the idea of dress and attire and so on, jewelry, things like that. Verse 11. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. So what does that mean? It says a little bit later, it says uh, the next verse that a woman is to also to, but to be in silence. It's not to teach and so on, but to be in silence. What does that mean? Does that mean, ladies, that when you enter the church, you're not allowed to speak? You know, that is, you can't talk to other ladies. You can't, you know, you, you uh, got to be just... And just completely quiet as a, as a church mouse. Yeah, that's not of obviously what it's saying. But notice the context of the verse. Let a woman do what? Learn in silence. So it's, what, what it is saying here is not that a woman is not permitted to speak in a church or to pray at, at proper times. I don't believe that a woman is to take a, place, a prominent place in the worship. But uh, there, when we have our prayer meetings, there's no, no problem whatsoever with a lady praying. Uh, in, during a special prayer time. So we're not talking about that, to, to be silent in that sense, but rather have the attitude of learning to be a teachable person. So a woman is to enter into the church with the attitude of submission to learn the Word of God, not, not to, to be the one that's, that's taking charge, but to be learning. Now, to be learning, for a woman to learn to say, look, ladies, we want you to learn. This was a radical idea uh, back in those days. It still is in, in some parts of the world. You go to Afghanistan, and one of the biggest controversies in Afghanistan, which they're all dismantling now <laughs> over there, is the idea of teaching women. As women were to go to school. They were to learn, learn how to read. Uh, some cultures don't like that. The Islamic culture being one does not care for that. Here we have it as a command. For ladies to learn. But the way you are to learn is to have a teachable spirit and to learn in silence. As Paul says, he says, I do not permit, if you'll notice there, verse 12, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Does that mean a woman cannot be Sunday school teachers? No. No, it does not mean that at all. No, no, women, there's, there's classes that women can teach, other ladies and children and so forth, but with the men, 
There is a restriction placed by the Word of God that a, a woman is not to be teaching the men. He, Paul says, under apostolic authority, this was not to be permitted. So, when the, 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 body, the church body comes together, a woman is not to be appointed to be the teacher over a mixed body that includes men, or to have authority. That is, to be placed in positions of authority within the church. This is not opinion. This is not, uh, it's, it's, it's a plain teaching of Scripture here, an apostolic uh, teaching by the Apostle Paul. A woman is not to be placed in a position of authority within the church. Hebrews 13, 17 uh, tells, talks us about that, that authority. Obey those who, have, who, who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch, for out, they watch out for your souls as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So there is within the church a certain uh, authority given to the elders within the church to oversee the church, to teach, to make sure that false doctrine is not creeping in, to deal with any sins that might be uh, springing up within the church, that the elders are to do that. That's a certain amount of authority given to the elders. Uh, that is not to be given to the women. As for, first Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So, elders within the church exercise this authority. Women then were forbidden to do so by the Apostle Paul. Sometimes it's necessary to reprove and to rebuke and then to exhort. Sometimes face to face you have to confront issues, you have to confront people. Uh, Paul says this is not for the ladies of the church. The ladies are to be teachable, they're to be learning. They don't have to be put and they should not be thrust into that position where they then have to get out in the middle of controversies and deal with these controversies. That is what Paul says is for the men that God has appointed for that office. So the scriptures are clear on this. The issue is the pressure from the culture to which the church has surrendered. No, so what's going on with, within, the, why are churches capitulating and thrusting women into these positions where, which God had not designed for them or commanded them not to do because the church has given in to the culture. So the woman rather than is to learn in silence, that is uh, to be learning with a teachable attitude with all submission. It's always been a priority in the Christian church to educate women even in the things of theology. Uh, we have our, our class Wednesday night going through systematic theology. There's no restrictions for ladies to come in and learn. Now, if one of the ladies there decided that she was going to get in the face of the, of the pastors who were there and argue theology with them, that might be an issue. <laughs> you know, and so that, that would be, as we'll see here a little bit later. But no, women are to learn. And this is not an isolated passage. You know, there, I was listening to a, a woman pastor on, the, on this passage trying to justify her being a pastor. And the way she described this passage was that Paul was instructing Timothy not to be bullied by the church matriarchs. There was women in the church that were bullying Timothy, and that's what, what this is all about. Well, there's no evidence for that. But even if it was, this is not the only place where it's taught. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 deals with this, among many other things. But Paul says, verse 34, Let your women keep silent in the church. It's the same thing here as we have what we have here. For they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. So does this mean complete silence? Obviously not but it means a teachable spirit. What's the, what's the context of this in 1 Corinthians 14? Well, if you go through the book of Corinthians, you're going to see all kinds of stuff out of order within the church. I mean, chaos within the church. Taking uh, brothers and sisters to law. They were uh, speaking 
yeah, just getting up and, and, and speaking out of order, four or five of them get up at one time and have a word of prophecy. And then there would be an abuse of tongues in the church. There was abuse at the Lord's table. And Paul was trying to correct all of this. And one of the things that he had to correct was the place of the woman within the church. Now, the key to understanding chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians is the last verse. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decorously and having good form. One of the problems there was that the women were out of order in the area of teaching and authority. So one of the signs of a disordered church, as we saw in Corinth, is that of permitting women to teach and hold offices of authority. This, of course, once again, is Scripture and not opinion. Paul required this. Paul told Timothy, you do this, you teach this. Make sure this does not happen within the church. Now, why, what's the reason behind it? He even gives us a reason here, verse 13 of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Well, we go to the created order. So what's going on here? What's, what are we talking about? Well, remember, <clears throat> at the creation, God made man from the dust of the earth. He saw it's not good for man to be alone. So what does he do? He, he causes Adam to go into a deep sleep. And he takes from Adam's, uh, out of Adam's body a rib and forms uh, the, the woman. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So the reason stated here was that the purpose of the, 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 the woman was to be a helper to the man. Ooh. Just think I, this is going out over Facebook. You know, it's, we're going to be in big trouble, folks. The, the, the woman completes the man. They function as a unit, combining their God-given gifts to do His will on this earth. Uh, alone, uh, they, they, they're not so effective, but you put them together, and they become very effective in pursuing holiness, in uh, pursuing the will of God, all of these things. They become more effective uh, so, but the, the fall complicated this. Part of the consequences of the fall, we find that the husband would rule over his wife, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. There was going to be conflict now between the husband and the wife in the area of headship. A Christian woman's duty is to recognize this conflict and submit to godly authority in both the church and in the home. A woman's role in the fall is pointed out. Look at verse 14. That leads us into that. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So we find here that in this horrible fall from what God had, uh, innocence, that God had made man and, and woman, uh, that you have the deception. Satan came in and deceived. But it was not Adam who was deceived. His role in the fall was not that he was duped by Satan, but he succumbed to the persuasions of his wife. Adam was entrusted with the oversight of the creation and was, was responsible to maintain obedience to the command of God. That one command, don't eat this fruit, this is mine. You, you, you can eat anything else you want, but not this. I am God, and I tell you this. And Adam fell. Not because he was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Eve had been deceived by the subtlety of Satan's crafty lies. She ate of the forbidden fruit, and then she persuaded her husband to eat. And why did this occur? What, what happened here? Eve stepped out of line, out of the role for which God had created her, that is, into the role of leadership. She opened herself up to the deception of Satan. The woman in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 is described by the Apostle Peter as the weaker vessel. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, generally speaking, the, the woman is physically weaker than the man. Uh, of course, there are always excep exceptions to that, but generally speaking, you now if you if my wife was here and uh, she's not, but you could just take a look at us. You'd be able to tell she's five foot tall. She weighs about a hundred pounds. You know that uh, uh, we don't 
go with, you know, she, we don't get into fist fights, so we, you know, anything like that. I don't physically abuse her, and you know, and she doesn't try to physically abuse me. It's, it's obvious that there is a difference in physical strength. There's also the area of emotions. We are built differently in an emotional and psychological level. Now that, and you can see this. You know, and I, I saw a video just right before I was preparing this sermon. I, I saw a video come up because of the controversies in the culture. The, the feminists will be proclaiming a woman can do anything that a man can do, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's actually a quotas now that, especially like in England and places, that you have to have so many women on, say, uh, for for firefighters. You know, you go to a, a, a firehouse. There's so many people they're hired, you have to have so many women, uh, so they, they open it up for women. But they're finding that, that, generally speaking, the women don't have the physical strength to do that. And there's also the, the area of, of, of emotional issues, so because we're made differently. And we have the same thing in God's kingdom. Women are not designed for the role of church leadership. You know, they say, well, why, why do men have to call all the shots? This is not just calling all the shots, folks. Whenever you're in a role of church leadership, you have to be able to face and discern false doctrine when it comes in and sometimes get into some pretty heated controversies. Now, you wouldn't know that. You know, people think Christianity is, is, is just like a, a bed of roses and everybody has to be nice all the time. That, that's, that's not uh, what Christianity is. We've got, we have a, a faith and we must defend the faith. You, you, know, you, you take a look at, at the, the book of, of Jude. We, we're, we've got to defend the faith. And that means going to war. And that means being confrontational at times. And that means saying things or doing things which are not going to bring favor upon you or the, or the church. Sometimes decisions have, difficult decisions have to be made. So uh, God has called men in leadership to do that. Uh, women, of course, are capable teachers. They can be capable leaders. They can have organizational, organizational skills, sometimes much better than men. But is it God's revealed will for the woman to be in the positions within the church? And we have to say from the Scripture that the answer is no. There's, there's, as far as I'm concerned, it is as plain as day when the Apostle in several places of Scripture absolutely forbids it. So we have to always go to the Word of God and not human reason. Of course, human reason works along with the Word of God, but the Word of God is always, always has first place and has the authority. So then how do we deal with the objections to this? You know, that, well, the, uh, there, there are many uh, things that are brought up. Well, first of all, we give no time to those who object to restricting women in the church roles because of the changing times. You know, well, you're behind the time. You know, you, you know, why, wh why are you acting like Neanderthals? You know, don't, can't you see all our... We give nothing to that whatsoever. It's the Word of God. Uh, when all of, of everything around us crumbles, and we can see the culture crumbling around us, when all of this crumbles, you know what's going to be left? Faithful churches. Those little clusters of faithful people who look to the Word of God as their standard and lived it. That's what's going to be left. And so as the world flounders, what do we do? Oh, there's the church. Maybe they have the answer. Instead of the church giving in and being with the culture and crumbling with the culture... The church needs to stand firm on the Word of God. So no, it doesn't matter. You can call us out of date. You can call us fundamentalist or whatever you want to. This is the, but it's the Word of God that we focus upon. There has been a steady slide into apostasy of the professing church for several centuries. And we're at the tail end of it. It's, it's now beginning to show. I mean, drag queens in church, folks. It's happening. You, know, you, you can get online and you'll see it. A man dressed as a woman, acting like a woman, preaching from the pulpit. It's happening. We're at the tail end of it, the, the apostasy. So, we don't give anything to that argument. There's, times will always change, but the Word of God does not. The multiplication of women in the ministry is but another picture of God's judgment against the apostate church. What does the Bible say? Well, Isaiah the prophet said, Isaiah 3 verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. 
O oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Ezekiel said, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So then that leads us to another question. Well, what if there are no men? Now, what are we going to do? Well, Jesus had an answer for that. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we need to be praying for men. Now, and I, I've been in, in multiple types of ministry over the years, over the decades. And I've, I've been in churches which are dominated by ladies. Now, sometimes there's, you know, they, there's just simply no men there. And I've seen churches that, that have male leadership. There's a great difference, folks. You see it here. And I've, I've seen it here. That's, what, what, why is Community Bible so different from some other churches? We have male leadership. You know, and they're, they're uh, qualified men, many, uh, well, all of them, <laughs> hopefully, qualified men in these positions. And spiritual men who love the Lord. It makes a difference. And it's a scriptural way. Say, so, well, what about the women in the Bible, the notable women of the, of the Bible, uh, the leaders and teachers in Scripture? Well, they're there, obviously. We have the case of Deborah, the judge, Hulda the prophetess, uh, that's uh, Second uh, Kings and Second Chronicles. We have in the New Testament the daughters of Philip. We have Priscilla and Aquila who taught Apollo, Apollos, I think his name was. And uh, so you have all these examples. You have Miriam. Uh, the sister of Moses, but there's always uh, a, a certain amount of, of submission there. Uh, and there are exceptions, of course, but that does not change the overall uh, spirit of Scripture when it comes to this. For example, you will find no women priests in the Old Testament, no women apostles in the New Testament. Uh, you uh, you find no women authors of, of the of, uh, books of the Bible, and so on. So there's a reason that God has done this. Calvin said, Extraordinary acts done by God do not overturn the ordinary rules of government by which he intended that we should be bound. Uh, so we, we look at some of the, of the objections to, the, to this teaching. We have to say, that, well, the Word of God is still plain and clear. The church was under the direction of the Lord to set, uh, uh, set up to be led by men, upheld, assisted, and encouraged by the helpmeets, the ladies that God gave them. And this we find the, the best situation within the church. Uh, ladies, you can rest assured that God's call to you does not include the responsibility of the church, of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God to the body of God's people. Rather, it is to serve the Lord as a helper within the church. You know, it, there's always vying for, for leadership, and, and you see it in the apostate denominations. But when you get back to the original church, it was the pastors, the elders, the bishops, the overseers, who were hauled before the Caesars and the Roman proconsuls and so, so on and so forth, and tortured and killed. Now, that, that can't happen again. Now, that's what our call is. It's just like uh, on the battlefield. I don't believe a woman should be on the front lines of the battlefield. I don't think a woman was created for that. I think it's a grave mistake to do that. Same with, with the idea of the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The old King James has a term for that, quit you like men. Because the word there for brave is adriste, which is act like men. Those in church leadership are to take heed to their calling to be faithful in the face of adversity, stand fast, and be willing to fight and die for the truth of Christ's church if that time comes. We are not to submit to the world. We are not to deny our Lord. We are to stand fast. And uh, it's the, lead, the men who are to be leading the church in that. Now, there is an interesting verse. I don't want to overlook it. The last verse. 
Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. This is one of the most difficult passages of uh, the, the, this text here, this, uh, of Timothy, to, to understand. What does it mean? Does that mean, well, the, you know, the, the woman's not to be teaching or anything like that, but she can still be saved if she has babies. You know, that, that's how a woman is, is saved. No, that's not what it's saying. It is, it's a very difficult passage. And the best thing I can do to give you an interpretation, I'm going to go to the MacArthur Study Bible. There's a note there, and I've, I was looking through a couple of different commentaries, and uh, I was pointed to this as, as one of the best explanations. Paul is teaching that even though a woman bears the stigma of being the initial instrument who led the race into sin, that is, with the temptation, it is women through childbearing who may be preserved or freed from that stigma by raising a generation of godly children. So, the woman then led in the fall, she can be saved from that stigma through the bearing of and leading and up, uh, of, of raising of, of godly children. It's, of course, it's not saying that uh, just simply by having babies a woman can be saved. That's obviously not it. So I, I hope that, that uh, lays to rest perhaps some of the questions that you, you may have had. If you have any questions on this particular issue, uh, I'd be willing uh, to, to uh, the best of my, my ability, have Chris answer. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'd be to the best of my ability to answer uh, such questions. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are most grateful for the Word, though we understand, Lord, that at times it may be controversial in this culture that we live in, this ungodly apostate culture. But Lord, as we admonish and encourage your people, Lord, may they see the Word for what it is. May we function as you have taught us to function within the church. And Lord, we know that you have promised blessing if we obey. Help us, Lord. Uh, that we may be strong to obey, that you may bring such blessing, Lord, that we may see that in, as the word goes out, that you may uh, call those on the outside, that they may see the truth and be converted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.